God, thank you so much um, for the privilege that we have to come together as a church, to share each other's burdens, to share meals together, um, to just share life together. There's, there's so much, there's so much beauty that comes with the body coming together. There's so many things, so many stories we can share of how faithful you've been to us, how in moments where it all seemed lost, you stepped in, how you are a healing God. You are the great physician. You are intimately connected with every single part of our lives, and you love showing up, love breaking in in unexpected ways where there seems to be no hope, where there seems to be no answers. God, we, we look to you. So, Father, for all these requests, for everything that was shared that we prayed over together as a community, for all the things that may be um, hurting a little too much right now that we're even a little afraid to share, God, thank you for hearing those prayers. Holy Spirit, thank you for in the moments when we don't even know how to pray, for interceding for us. We love you. Thank you for loving us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So uh, this week we should have had handouts at the back, so if you missed them, they're on the table back there. Uh, but we're in week six of this study. Uh, we've got one more. Um, and we've been diving in for the past five weeks looking at three seemingly unrelated groups, three seemingly unrelated paths that on the surface, it, it doesn't seem like they really share a lot of in common, but as soon as you kind of start peeling back the layers, you realize that it's one pathway that leads to a false gospel. So we've been looking at three different groups. Uh, we've been looking at wokeness, progressive Christianity, and then where we got our name for our class, uh, those who are deconstructing. And the reason that we even called this class Deconstruction is because the rise in the church of those who are deconstructing. You hear story after story after story. Um, it, it, they're, they're showing up on social media. They're friends of yours. They're family. Uh, where people are just deconverting. They're dismantling the core tenets of their faith and walk. And a lot of times, sometimes they're able to put some things back together. But even when we looked at those who are trying to guide them through deconstruction, like the story in Sophia Society, they're like, you can put some things back in the house, but don't, don't build anything too strong, too sure. And so it just becomes this faith that's just rocked so easily, and, and the wind comes, and, and it just leaves people with just this sense of nothing stable. And in Matthew 24, the disciples were asking Jesus, they were like, hey, tell us what it's going to be like at, at the end, tell us what it's going to be like, because he had been he had been telling them already, like, I, I'm going to be going away. I'm going to a place that you, you can't follow, and then I'm going to be coming back. And so they said, well, tell us what it's going to be like at the end. So he starts off in Matthew 24, and he gives this very graphic description of all the things that are going to be happening. And then in Matthew 25, he gives two parables and a true story. Uh, and we're going to look at one of those really quick. And in Matthew 25, uh, verses 1 through 13, uh, the verses will be up on, uh, up on the screen. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them are foolish and five are wise. The five who were foolish didn't take enough olive oil for their lamps, but the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. And at midnight, they were roused by the shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. All the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones uh, asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. But the others replied, Well, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to a shop and buy some for yourselves. But while they were gone to buy oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went in with them to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. Later, when the other five bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, Believe me, I don't know you. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know the day or the hour of my return. 
And the, this parable is meant to kind of tell us about how the church will be right before Jesus comes again. Five were wise and had enough oil, and five were foolish and didn't. And oil throughout the Bible is used to represent the presence of the Holy Spirit. That's why when they anointed Aaron, that was he was being anointed with the Holy Spirit to be able to be a priest to lead them. All throughout the Bible, there's story after story after story where oil is used as the presence of the Holy Spirit. So when we, we, we each are filled with the Holy Spirit, when we receive Christ as our Savior, when we say, God, I, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins, and I believe that you rose from the grave, I accept your payment of my sins, and I give you my heart in return. You are Lord of my life. In that moment, we are anointed. We are filled with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus was saying, right about the time that I come back, there's going to be a good portion of the church, uh, half, that think that they have a relationship with me, that think that they have it, but because of these different things, these cultural things that are, that are pulling people away and pulling people out, they don't have a real relationship with me. They've rejected the scripture. They've rejected their need for Jesus to atone for their sins, and they've abandoned the gospel. Uh, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul was writing, the, he wrote the first letter to the Thessalonians, and then some people started spreading a rumor that the rapture had already happened, and they were going, oh, no, no, we've been left behind. And, and Paul is writing 2 Thessalonians to him, and he said, no, 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 no one is deceive you in any way, for it will not come, Jesus' return will not come until the apostasy comes first, and the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, is revealed, the son of destruction. 1 Timothy 4, 1 says, Now the Holy Spirit tells us clearly that in the last times, in those last days before Jesus comes back, some, and it can be, some translations say, many will turn away from the true faith. They will follow deceptive spirits and teachings that come from demons. And the whole book of Jude is talking about the false teachings that are going to be rising up at those last days, right before Jesus returns. And, it's, and Jude's whole the whole chapter is just for us to be on guard against these heretical ideologies. And so that's why our class goal is to educate and equip you to engage the culture around you in gospel conversations. And as you do, stand firm on the truth. Because we're living in the last days. There are so many different prophecies that have been given. And Jesus, even as he was talking, he was like, this generation will not pass away until all these things have come, come to pass. And all the things that Jesus was talking about, we, we're seeing them play out in front of us. We are living in the last days. We are seeing this, this falling away. And these ideas are everywhere around us. They're, they're cultural ideas that are founded, we talked about in the first week, on a secular humanistic worldview. But they're creeping into the church. And they're invading and eroding. And a lot of times they're destroying the faith of church members to the point to where we can't share the gospel because we don't even know what we hold on to anymore. And that's what deconstruction is. It's a full-on dismantling of your faith. And a huge caveat, I have to say this, I said it the first time that I even talked about this back in February. If you are doubting, if you're here and you're struggling with your faith, if you have experienced trauma from people in the church, um, which is... That's typically the number one reason why people deconstruct is they get hurt by people in the church and that just causes them to be like, well, if they're supposed to look like Jesus and they behave like that, then maybe I don't want to follow you. If that's you, if you're struggling with doubts, you're welcome here. If we took a poll, uh, and we won't, um, but I bet most of us in here have been hurt at some point by someone in the church. It may have been in leadership, it may have just been a church member, but that's what happens when we're in relationships and we're close together. I would love to say that in our marriage relationship, I have loved Hannah perfectly and never done anything wrong and never hurt her, but I have. When we're close, when we, have, when we share the, those really intimate relationships, we end up hurting each other because we're fallen. We misunderstand. We misread situations. We do the wrong thing. We have bad days. But that's no reason to just abandon everything. And if you're coming here with doubt, it's okay. Jesus was surrounded. The, when he 
died on the cross. Nobody, everybody walked away, and they were like, oh, we, we completely misread it. He's not the Messiah. We completely mistook everything he said. Nobody was standing outside the tomb counting down 10, 9, eight, no, no one was there. Everyone doubted. Everyone abandoned him. But in that moment, Jesus, when he came back to life and he appeared to the disciples, the first thing he didn't do was like, all right, line up. I'm chewing you all out. How dare you turn your back on me? Have you not realized who I am? No, he, he loved them. He spoke life to them. He invited them to follow him as the only one worthy of their devotion, the one who is victorious over sin, death, and the grave, the spotless lamb of God, whoo, about to drop my clicker, who took our place, bore our sins, died our death, so that he could give us his place, his righteousness, his everlasting life. And how do we learn all these things? We learn them from the scripture. There, that's, again, we talked about that when we were talking about how these groups have a low view of scripture that sometimes Christians can be accused of bibliolatry, of, of worshiping the Bible. It's like, no, no, we don't worship the Bible, but the Bible is what tells us all about Jesus. It's where we hear his words of life. It's where we understand who God is and we hear the very words of God that are inerrant. And that means that there is no mistakes. It's infallible, which means, how many of y'all have ever taken a test and you're like, how in the world did I get 100 on that? I was guessing on half of these things. Like, inerrant just doesn't mean like, whoo, I guessed right, we made it through. Infallible means he's not capable of making mistakes because it's God himself and it's inspired, it's breathed out by God and filled with the power of God because it's the very words of God. So tonight we're going to look at the last of three areas where historic biblical Christianity and these three groups diverge, uh, and that's the gospel. And again, for the last two weeks, the first ones we looked at were the scripture and the cross. Uh, and we've been mainly looking at the two sides from wokeness and progressive Christianity because deconstruction tends to borrow from either one or the other or both. Um, it, it's one where... It, those who are deconstructing, again, they're looking around trying to find something to reconstruct their faith with. And sadly, when they're handed something from these other two groups, there's not much left. So Vody Bauckham's book, Fault Lines, was my introduction to this new movement and seeing, we've been seeing on the rise in the church. And the reason he called it Fault Lines is he was like, it's like an earthquake that's breaking open. And there's this huge divide. Now, we, we used to be divided over little things like color of the carpet or what songs to sing. He was like, those were little bitty, little bitty things. But he was like, now we're seeing this huge seismic shift between historic biblical Christianity and the woke social justice movement. And many Christians with really, really good intentions, with good hearts, they're drawn in by all the words that are, that are used surrounding social justice. I mean, it sounds like a good thing. Who wouldn't want justice? We're made in the image of God. He is perfectly just, and we want to see things be put right here on the earth. We want to go in and rescue the oppressed. But what happens when you apply critical theory, and specifically critical race theory, to society is you no longer speak of individual injustices. There's not a person that committed this. It is, remember the analogy we talked about? If there was an accident, it's not only the person who was involved in the accident, it's anyone who ever benefited from riding in a car ever, or worked on a car, or did anything. It's a systemic problem. And you have to accept the ideas from Marx that there only exists the oppressor and the oppressed. And in the case of critical race theory, it's White people are the oppressor who always oppress people of color, whether by actual deed or just living in the system of oppression and living with this oppressive ideology, which is, they called it the hegemony, that's the oppressive ideology of whiteness or racism that keeps people of color from awakening their racial consciousness and overthrowing the system that oppresses them. But what happens when you start buying into all that is it creates a new religion which is why Vody and lots of others, he, in his book, he, literally, he says, I wasn't the first one to start calling it a cult or a new religion. There's, there's many that do. Um, but here's a couple things 
uh, that, that go along with it. So the cosmology, the, the origin of everything, uh, it starts with critical theory and critical race theory and intersectionality. That's where everything starts. There's a new original sin, which is racism, that if you are born with a certain amount of melanin, you are immediately born as an oppressor or the oppressed. There's a new law, anti-racism. It's not enough to say, I, I'm not a racist. I, I, don't, I haven't participated in any of that. You have to actively do the work of anti-racism to oppose that. And remember, Ibram X. Kendi, he said the only way way to make up for past discrimination is present discrimination, and the only way to make up for present discrimination is future discrimination. So the only way to fight racism is to be racist now and be even more racist in the future to make up for what was going on. It never, there, there's no atonement whatsoever. The gospel is racial reconciliation. The martyrs are Saints Trayvon, Mike, George, Brianna, etc., the priest, and we talked about that when we talked through scripture, the oppressed minorities, that if you don't have a person of color to help you interpret scripture through the lens of critical theory and critical race theory, using intersectionality, you can't understand the scriptures. The word of God is closed off to you. The means of atonement is reparation. There's a new birth. When you have, when you have been born again, you've become woke. The liturgy is lament. The canon is critical social justice and social science. The theologians are D'Angelo, Kendi, Brown, Crenshaw, McIntosh, and the catechism is say their names. So Neil Shinvey, uh, he did, he's been another great one. Uh, again, I, I'm going to give you guys at the end all the bibliography, the books we've been using, different podcasts and sermons and um, just lectures you can listen to. He, he spoke at S Southeastern Seminary uh, doing an intro into critical theory. And he, he did this where he put these two in contrast. So Christianity and the, the, the whole story of the Bible and the gospel can be kind of broken up into four, four things. Uh, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. In the beginning, God created man in his own, own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And it was perfect. And we had a perfect relationship with God. And we lived in paradise but then Adam and Eve rebelled against God, and so sin came into the world, and each of us has rebelled against God as well. And last week, we looked at the depth of sin that we're all capable of committing. And a side note, as, as I'm looking at these ones that are denying original sin, I was like, surely, you guys don't have kids. Because as much as I love our children, like from birth, we never had to teach them to sin. Like it just comes natural. Literally, without even trying, that is just, it's like breathing to them. They're just like, I am, they were born to be little sinners. And I love them. And they're glorious and they're beautiful. And I love those little sinners more than anything on the face of the earth. But that, it's just, it's inborn. Anyways, that was, we do lots of heavy stuff. That was a funny thing that just kind of jumped into my head. So we're all born in sin, and we're in need of a Savior. So Jesus came and died in our place. That's redemption. As our substitute, satisfying the wrath of God, which we talked about last week, isn't some just temper tantrum or where he just flies off the handle. No, it was a measured response where evil demands a response. When we hear about all these atrocities, nobody thinks like, oh, well, you know, the Nazis, I, I think they were generally good guys. We'll just... Let them have a pass. No, it, it's a measured, poured out justice that Jesus fully took on himself. He drank the cup of God's wrath to pay for our sins. But then three days later, he rose again. And now we have the hope of heaven and a new heaven and a new earth. There's the restoration. One day there will be a new heaven and new earth where there is no more sin. There is no more disease. There's no more brokenness or death but in critical theory, there is no creation story because, remember, these ideas come from Marx and Darwin who rejected any idea of a creator, period. They said we're all here by chance. There's no transcendent creator who has a purpose and design for our lives and identities. We don't primarily exist in relationship to God. We exist in relationship to others and other groups. Our identity is not in terms of who we are as God creation, instead, who we are as God's creation. Instead, we define ourselves in terms of race, 
class, sexuality, and gender identity. Oppression, not sin, that is our fundamental problem. And what's the solution? Activism, social justice, changing structures, raising awareness. We work to overthrow and dismantle the hegemonic power, that oppressive ideology that's keeping whatever group down. And again, critical race theory deals with race, but remember we're about to look at the, the wheel of power and privilege. It doesn't stop there. What's our purpose in life? To work for the liberation of all who oppress groups so that we can achieve a state of equity. And so here's the, the wheel of power and privilege again. Um, and this is where intersectionality comes in. So there's critical theory, and those play into lots of different ways. Critical race theory, specifically applied to race. Intersectionality, that's where things get kind of dangerous. Neil Shinvey, again, he was in that same lecture, and there's other things that I've heard of him. He, he called it not just intersecting areas of oppression, but interlocking. So you can't just see one area of oppression and be like, oh, well, this group, I think we're seeing that. No, they all interlock, and you have to equally see every single one of them and acknowledge them equally as well. Ibram X. Kendi, one of the leading voices in the woke movement, in his book, How to Be an Anti-Racist, said, we cannot be anti-racist if we're homophobic or transphobic. And that's why, again, what started... For, for me, where I, I ran across this in the first place is it started off with our pastor who wanted to have a gay couple that was involved in the church, but then all of a sudden it led to all these things where he was just like, you know, there's many paths to God, and the Bible is oppressive, and God is bloodthirsty, and you're going, whoa, 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 where, where does all this come from? Well, it comes from you have to start acknowledging the oppression from all the different groups. So those who have adopted critical race theory, um, and it, that's where it typically starts for, for those in the church. It's kind, of, it's kind of a gateway drug. It's the one where because of what has happened in our American past, we, we do have feelings of guilt of like, oh my goodness, like I wish that hadn't happened, but it did. And I wish those things weren't there, but they did. And we have to acknowledge it. And it, it becomes all very charged emotionally quickly. But once you get in, then it opens you up to all the others. And that's why when there was the leaked document out of the Supreme Court, I don't know if it's in your guys' social media feed, but in in mine, I started seeing all these people who identified as Christians, but they were just losing it, um, thinking that this decision, that Roe versus Wade might be overturned. Uh, because one of the areas of oppression is men, let's see, I'm trying to find the language, gender, oop, so cisgender men oppressing cisgender women and using the oppressive ideology of patriarchy and honestly any type of authority structure to uphold that power in society. So they were not only seeing the oppression that minorities were having to do with critical race theory, they were saying, no, 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 men are oppressive of women and anything that stops them from being fully liberated, anything that keeps them from having the full women's reproductive rights, that is oppressive. We need to tear that down. We need to tear apart this ideology. It, it doesn't matter that abortion is murder. Sure, that's fine. But we need to stop the oppression before we stop the murder, and it's, and it's weird. And, and it's so strange that those two things just don't line up in their minds. Um, anywho, sorry, I kind of got off on a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, Owen Strayan, um, he, he described kind of the whole gospel of wokeness in, in this quote. He said, as a system, we conclude that wokeness both adds to and subtracts from the gospel. There's more that must be done for white people than the simple gospel does. Thus, it is finished is not technically correct. Wokeness would have us correct Jesus in his dying breath at Calvary. There's more for sinners to do than just believe and repent, so wokeness adds to the gospel. But it also subtracts. It takes away the transforming power that's in the blood of Christ. We may get our ticket punched to heaven, but if we've bought into whiteness, whether personally or as a system, we are not transformed. We need human ideology, critical race theory for this. We need anti-racism. We need even as born-again believers to go further and overcome our condition of oppressor. Wokeness adds to the gospel, therefore wokeness subtracts from it. 
The end result is a gospel that is thoroughly unlike the biblical gospel. Stronger still, the end result is a gospel that is anti-gospel. Wokeness is an anti-gospel because it's a works based religion. Remember, you have to do the work of anti-racism. And the thing is, you can never do enough. You can never limit enough. You can never pay enough reparations. You can never surrender enough of your power. It, there is no end to it. It's a workspace religion that has no end. And it ends up being so futile. And it's not good news. The progressive view of the gospel uh, it's a little bit harder to nail down, but I found uh, eight tenets of progressive Christianity, which uh, they, they don't really like holding to dogmas or systems of belief. So this isn't a statement of belief. Like if you asked anybody who is a progressive Christian, uh, they wouldn't say, oh, yeah, we all have to hold to all eight of these. But even as I was doing research for this for this class tonight, it blew me away that how many align with this. So we're going to kind of work through these eight tenets. So the first one is, uh, and this comes directly from the website progressivechristianity.org. These are the eight tenets, uh, and any church that, uh, there's tons of different churches. If you look up, I just looked up the eight tenets of progressive Christianity. It took me to progressivechristianity.org, and then under that was tons of different churches that have posted this as their part of what we believe. Uh, so the first thing is believe that following the path and teachings of Jesus can lead to an awareness and experience of the sacred and the oneness and the unity of life. So this, this statement right here introduces the idea of panentheism. So pantheism states that all is God, like the universe is God, and panentheism says God is in all, like a hand in a glove. So when God created everything, he put a little bit of his essence into everything, into the trees, the mountains, the birds, the rocks, etc., even humans. And he put the divine spark in each of us, and all you have to do is look deep enough, take some time and meditate, look in, and you'll see the divine spark, the God within you. Sounds kind of familiar, right? But last time it was kind of with a hiss. It was like, you shall be as God's Genesis 3. This goes against the biblical understanding of God as transcendent, that he's above, holy, and separate from his creation, but also his omnipresence, because his omnipresence, while it sounds like they're kind of the same thing, his omnipresence means that he cannot be contained in anything by any physical matter. Otherwise, Jesus or God wouldn't have spoken so harshly against the idol worship that was happening all through the Old Testament. Where he was talking about you worship these gods made of wood and clay and silver and gold. And they have eyes, but they can't see. And they have mouths, and they can't speak. And they have ears, and they can't hear. They can't help you. Because if God was in everything, then it would have been like, well, a part of me is in there. So I guess worshiping a part of me is equal. It's like, no. The oneness and the unity, that's, that's a very Eastern thought that came into it. The second is affirm the teachings of Jesus provide but one of many ways to experience the sacredness and oneness of life and that we can draw from diverse sources of wisdom in our spiritual journey. Jesus is one of many pathways to God. We can draw from lots of different places of wisdom. Scripture is one, the Bhagavad Gita, the Quran, all these different, it's one of many ways. Jesus is a way to God, but he is not the way. And whatever feels right to you is right. But the thing that I love about God is he's specific. And he's specific because he wants to be found. If I invited you over for dinner today or this evening after the class, I wouldn't say, all right, hop in your car, drive. Wherever you feel, north, south, east, west, whatever is good to you. Drive until you find a spot that you think is pretty good. Pull into a neighborhood or don't. That's up to you. You do you. You pull into wherever you'd like to go. When you get there, go up to the house. Don't knock. We'll be there. It's just fine. Just help yourself in. Come on in, and we'll have dinner. It's like, no, no, that's a quick way to get shot in Tennessee. But if I wanted you to find me, I would say, all right, head north on 153. When you pass under 27, take your first left on Old Dayton. Take the first right on Pitts Road. We're at the corner of Pitts and Levi. Follow it right down there. You'll see a giant 50-foot slide in the background. That's us. And I'm sure the, some of y'all have seen it. That's us. Anyways, we're the weirdos that have that big slide, and it's so much fun. I actually need to work on it a little bit because we had a little crack in it. But anyways, 
But if I invited you to do that, that's not because I'm being mean and being like, well, there's only one way to me. Yeah, I, I, there's one way to me because I want you to find me. I don't want you driving off in thousands of different directions. I don't want you getting lost or shot. Like, I want you to find me. And that's why Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. Now, here we go to number three. Seek community that is inclusive of all people, including but not limited to conventional Christians and questioning skeptics. So read questioning skeptics as atheists. Believers and agnostics, women and men, those of all sexual orientations and gender identities, those of all classes and abilities. Now, the church should be a place where everyone feels welcome. Jesus was constantly surrounded by people who were nothing like him, but he loved them and wanted to bring them into relationship with him by grace, through faith, believing that he is the way, the truth, the life. He was constantly inviting people to leave their life of sin and come follow him. But when they talk about this is inclusive of all people, this even means in leadership. There's an online progressive church that's pastored by a progressive Christian and an atheist because they want to make sure that the, both sides are being fully represented equally. Uh, there's a church in Nashville that just hired a secular humanist to come on staff and walk their people through deconstruction so that they can fully realize who they were meant to be. And, and it's, it's this thing of where we have to, instead of Seeing people where they are, uh, Max Lucado said it one, in one of his books, God loves you just the way you are, but he doesn't want to leave you that way. He wants to make you just like Jesus. The more that we become like Jesus, the more our truer selves we discover. We were made in his image. We were made to come alive with him. We were made to experience him forever. But progressive Christianity is like, no, 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 you do you, whatever you feel, whatever is right. And it kind of leads to this point. There's a three-minute clip. You may or may not have seen it. Uh, I'm going to share it. It's from the Duke Divinity School. Here we go. Good morning, the holy and queer one be with you. Good morning and welcome to worship. My name is Caroline Camp. I use she, they pronouns. I am the communications coordinator for Duke Divinity Pride, and I am ecstatic to see this worship space so full and so vibrant with color. Thank you all for being here at the first ever Divinity Pride worship collaboration. to thank everybody who had a hand in making this happen, from the chaplain's office to those who folded the bulletins, to the music, and to you. Thank you for being here today. We at Divinity Pride want to create a worship space that honors and celebrates all of our unique and good identities. Today, you will hear from four amazing speakers and three beautiful soloists who will give words to their experiences with the God who calls them. We want to affirm everyone to be who they truly are, to step into the Holy One's fire that burns away all that says we are not good enough and refines us by the Pentecostal fire to be who exactly the great queer one calls us to be. Let the spirit move you today. Lift your hands and your voices and dance in whatever way is most freeing for you. Would you please stand, step into this worship space and pray with me the words found in your bulletin and on the screen. Strange one, fabulous one, fluid and ever becoming one. Do not allow us to make our ideas of you into an idol. You are as close to us as our own breath, and yet your essence transcends all that we can imagine. You are mother, father, and parent. You are sister, brother, and sibling. You are drag queen and trans man and gender fluid, incapable of limiting your vast expressions of beauty. Embodied in us, your creation, we recognize our flesh in all its forms is made holy in you. With thanksgiving, we celebrate your manifestation in all its glorious forms. Blessed are our bodies, blessed is our love, 
Blessed are we when we celebrate that which the world turns away. Fill our hearts with a pride rooted in resistance to all that seeks to destroy. Please remain standing and sing with us. So I don't know if you caught in there. It's anything that makes you not feel like who you are. Use your Pentecostal fire to burn away anything where we may see in ourselves some things that need to be shaped. This is me paraphrasing. Something that needs to look like you. So here we go on to number four. Know that how we behave towards one another is the fullest expression of what we believe. So this echoes the wokeness gospel that says Jesus plus social justice is how you become a believer. And the works come first. Uh, you're not an, it's not an outpouring of your new identity in Christ. It's not because Christ is now in you and you are so you have been forgiven so much, and now you want to forgive others. You have been loved so much. You've experienced life, and now you want to turn around and serve others with the hope that as you're serving them, you get an opportunity to tell them about Jesus. It's the complete other way around. It's the works first. It's a works-based gospel. Number five says, find grace in the search for understanding and believe there's more value in questioning than absolutes. And this is a little bit of a funny one because they're absolute in their belief that there is no absolutes. Um, and so it's weird. They're going, there's more questioning than absolutes, and you have to hold to that. That's an absolute statement. But there's no absolutes. Uh, so if you walk with surety on a subject, if you use scripture as your basis of truth, you're seen as arrogant, intolerant, bigoted, etc. Number six, strive for peace and justice among all people. Now, this is one we should all hope and strive for. But knowing that the world is broken, knowing that sin has just broken us so much, knowing that fully coming to justice, fully having peace among all people, that will not come until the new heavens and the new earth. And also, when they speak of justice, they're not talking about justice where we, are, we have equal rights and equal justice under the law, it's equal outcomes. Remember I told you that's where equity comes in, that if I can throw a football and Tom Brady can throw a football, I should make millions of dollars because we should have equal outcomes because both of us can throw a football. And that's one of the things where, again, anybody can kind of shrug that off, but that's, that's what it is. It's not equal opportunities, it's equal outcomes. That if two people come to a place and it, they may have differing skin color, they may have different genders, it doesn't matter. If there's one slight difference and they have a different outcome, then that is, an, that is a proven subject that there is injustice. And there's systems of injustice that meant that they got different outcomes with what they did. Uh, number seven is strive to protect and restore the integrity of our earth. As Christians, we should be good stewards of the earth. That was our first assignment in the garden. But because they see God in everything and because of panentheism, remember there's the spark of divine in everything. To do anything to the earth, even good things like clearing land for a home, that can be hateful and it can be awful. It's harming God himself by trying to create a space where you can build a family, have life, share things together. And number eight, commit to a path of lifelong learning, compassion, and selfless love. And here's again where we share their same vocabulary but not their same dictionary. In this case, to selflessly love somebody is to fully affirm, again, going back to that service, anything that makes you think that you're not who you should be, the love you should be, whatever you feel, that you're, that you're not fully realized, that, that should be thrown away. You have to be affirmed in everything. And honestly, again, as a parent, I love my kids more than I can express but because I love them, I don't affirm everything that they do. I'm not like, hey, that's a good idea. Whack your sister upside the head if she takes your toy. Like, no, I love you. Do not do that. Please stop. You're going to hurt your sister. This is not going to end well. The people who've loved me the most in my life have been, up, been able to walk up to me and say, I love you. And I love you so much that I'm willing to risk our relationship to tell you, this isn't a wise path you're walking down. You need to turn away. This isn't going to lead where you want it to go. That's what real love is. Sometimes it does mean that we support and affirm each other. Sometimes it means we do the hard work of saying, 
because I love you so much. I don't want to see you get hurt. I don't want to see you buying into these ideas that are going to leave you with a gospel that is just meaningless. In her book, Another Gospel, Elisa Childers said, her current pastor said, the easiest way to spot heresy is to remember this formula. Jesus plus anything equals a false gospel. So with wokeness, it's, and in progressive Christianity, it's Jesus plus social justice. You have to do the work of anti-racism on the woke side. Same thing on the progressive side. You have to be doing these works. The way that you show, now, and, they, and they, they pull some things from James out of context as well, that we as believers, our relationship with Christ should overflow into good works around us, but that's not what we do to have relationship with Jesus. The relationship comes first, and out of that flows the thing, our actions. Or Jesus plus a special knowledge. Again, on the woke side, you need those voices of people of color. You need that ethnic Gnosticism that Vodi talked about to be able to understand the scriptures. You need the tools of critical race theory and intersectionality to understand it. Also in progressive Christianity, it's in their name, that they have a progressive understanding. And when we talked about the scriptures, Brian McLaren is a huge one saying, you know, even Jesus himself, he was mistaken. We know better now. We're more evolved. We've learned more. We know now. We have a special knowledge that we didn't have to get from Scripture. And then Jesus minus judgment is another one. And we talked about that last week when we were looking at the progressive view that says, well, I'm basically good. I don't need a Savior. And the woke side that said, well, I don't need a Savior either. We just need liberation from oppression. And there was an atheist, Christopher Hitchens, he was famous, he was one of the guys that were known as the neo-atheists, and he was interviewed for Portland Monthly about his opposition to religion, and specifically Christianity. And the minister questioning him noted that the Christianity he opposed in one of his best-selling books was of the fundamentalist variety, which, and she identified herself as a liberal Christian. So after explaining that she didn't take the stories in Scripture literally and rejected the atonement, she asked Hitchens if he saw a difference between the fundamentalist faith and more liberal or progressive religion. And here's his answer. I would say that if you don't believe that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ and Messiah, that he rose again from the dead, and by his sacrifice our sins are forgiven, you're not really in any meaningful sense a Christian. And that's what's at stake. We're not talking about differing views here, again, of like how we should do communion or different songs to sing or how our services should go. Should we have, you know, should we stand and kneel? It, 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 little things that can, that are, that are easy to get past. These are bedrock truths. Abandoning the source of objective truth in the scripture. Denying Christ was God himself. Denying his sacrifice on our behalf. And denying the resurrection from the dead. Proving he is God. And he has defeated death and sin once and for all. And he offers the gift of salvation freely to anyone who would believe him. Without that good news, what gospel do we have? And here's the last thing. It comes from Jude. Again, Jude, the whole thing is he's talking about the great falling away, the great apostasy that's going to be happening right before Jesus comes back. He says, but you, my dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit, and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. And you must show mercy to those whose faith is wavering. Again, if you're here and you have doubts, what we've been talking about, uh, and, I, and I've passionately been speaking, opposing these false ideas, but if you're struggling with doubt, I don't want you to ever feel that you can't bring those doubts because there are certain times where circumstances just cut our legs out from underneath us, where we're hurting so bad that we can't figure out what's going on and we need the church, we need the body, we need people calling us back to the truth of who God is, of what he has said, to help us work through that. So we want to show mercy if your faith is wavering. We want to rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy still to others, but do so 
with great caution. And that's what this whole class has been about, teaching you these ideas, trying to be able to understand fully what's going on, hating the sins that contaminate their lives because this is stealing the gospel. It's stealing the truth from them. Now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time and in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Let me pray for us. Lord, I pray that as we go through this series, we, we again, we're not trying to pick up stones so that we can turn and throw it, to the, throw it at those around us. But Lord, that we would be armed with the truth so we can see the schemes of the enemy trying to come in. Because God, we see what happens. We see how the truth and the beauty of the gospel is hollowed out. The beauty of the price you paid for us taken away, how you rescued us in the middle of our sin. Our source of truth is ripped out of our hands. God, these are dangerous, dangerous lies and it has caught too many people in the church. And Father, as long as you allow me to serve here, I will do everything in my power to equip this church with the truth to strengthen them, to encourage them, to call them back to this authentic biblical faith that we've received, to hold tightly to what is true, to hold tightly to you, to share the beauty of the gospel wherever you send us. God, we love you. We love you. Thank you for the privilege of being able to come together and discuss these things that are happening all around us strengthen your people, give them wisdom as they have conversations with friends and neighbors and co-workers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Love you guys. See you next week. If you need me, I'll be down here to answer any questions.